everybody, I think we'll start in like a minute. So uh, thanks for joining. All right, Sarah, do you want to uh, kick us off? It looks like we got about uh, 15 folks. I've got you all muted, so go in the chat if you need to be unmuted right now to, to say something, but I think Sarah's going to say something quick. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and get started. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who's um, showed up tonight uh, to learn some really good information and probably to ask some questions about offshore wind technology. Uh, my name is Sarah Kavrak, and I am the ocean policy advocate here with the Cape Fear chapter of the Surfrider Foundation here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I'm really, really excited that Matt Gove, our presenter tonight, has in fact agreed to present um, the information that he has diligently been um, scouring and uh, compiling, and he has very quickly become Surfrider's offshore wind technology guru. So thank you so much, Matt, for being here. And I will turn the floor over to you and let you go ahead and get started. Um, and yes, if anyone has questions, pop them into the chat. And I'm sure that you know Matt will field those whenever he has time or at the end. I'm not sure what your process is. But at any time, I'm sure. And if anyone has questions, they can just populate them right over there. So thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, and Sarah didn't mention that this was uh, her idea, I believe, to, to get us talking about wind and reached out and, uh, yeah, said, Let's talk about wind and I agreed. So um, yeah, my name is Matt and I work for Surfrider. I work in the region north of y'all from Virginia to New York, which we call the Mid-Atlantic. And um, I live in New York City. So um, the Surfrider staff that works with your region, um, Sarah Damron is actually uh, not on the call tonight. She just told me she couldn't make it, um, but you guys have probably heard of her. What else was I gonna do? Yeah. Um, Put questions in the chat for now. If I see them while I'm talking, I'll answer them. Otherwise, we'll do them at the end. I'll chat a little bit um, about offshore wind. There's a lot. I'm going to try to do my wind 101, um, which is getting pretty deep, but not too deep. And we'll have a few polls. Um, and the other thing, yeah, what, why am I talking about wind? I am kind of the unofficial um, wind person at Surfrider. I have probably listened to at least 50 webinars about wind because there's there's a lot of projects on the East Coast and uh, I've had to try to keep up with them as, as a staffer for Surfrider. So I don't know if I'd call myself an expert, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so we'll start. So I'll be trying to present, watch the chat. You can see my email, that's not cool. Okay, here we go. All right, let's try to watch the chat while I'm going here. Try to watch the participants. I'm assuming y'all can see my slide. Okay, here we go. And people are still showing up, great. All right, um, yeah, if you have any questions um, afterwards, just there's my email, please, please send me an email and to see amazing Instagram content, follow at Surfrider Mid-Atlantic. If we have folks on the line who aren't um, familiar with Surfrider, we're, we're basically the coastal folks, coastal defenders. There's our tagline right there. You may have heard of one of your local chapters in, in North or South Carolina. We have chapters all over the country of volunteers who, who love their beach and want to protect it. We work pretty much uh, um, on almost 
everything ocean and coastal, um, really except for fisheries. So we're we're all over the place uh, on the coast, trying to trying to protect it, keep the water clean, keep the beaches clean, uh, keep access for all to the beach. Poll number one. I think I have to go out of this to do that. All right. Here we go. Let's hear what you guys think. You should be able to click on the poll on the screen. Um, if it's not working, someone tell me in the chat, but it looks like it's working. <clears throat> okay, great. All right, so this will be good. It looks like we got uh, quite a bit of folks um, who uh, just know a bit about wind and a few that have been, been delving a little deeper, so that's great. You all saw the, the poll results, I think. Okay. All right, now we have to go back in. A little janky, but it's kind of fun to see what you all are thinking. Okay. Um, Surfrider does have an official policy. This is just kind of like a, an aside. Um, that's just to see where we're coming from as an organization. It's on our website. And it's, it's for all renewable energy that's in the ocean. So we do have an official policy and uh, you can find that if you really wanna geek out, but um, this is our CEO and he's, he's summing it up for you that we're, we're striving to support offshore renewable energy and offshore wind if it's done right. Um, and done right is a high bar for environmental protection, recreational protection, uh, transparency, stakeholder involvement, all that stuff is in our official policy. So that's kind of the nerdy uh, beginning to how we're looking at offshore wind. Okay. And uh, really where, um, I'm not sure where I got this slide, but this is this is a surf rider here trying to weigh the impacts from offshore wind, which they're, you know, I'm going to get into it. There's definitely going to be impacts to putting large machines in the ocean. Um, but we're also looking at the impacts from climate change. And we're very concerned um, about the impacts um, from climate change on the ocean as well. So that's 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 us there trying to balance these things um, with offshore wind. Here's the basics. Um, you know, when you first look at offshore wind, it's pretty simple. You you put turbines uh, into the substrate offshore, and you you have cables that connect underground, and the power goes um, back to shore basically, and then connects into our our traditional grid onshore. But uh, as you start Getting deeper into wind, every, everything gets more and more complicated, but that's kind of the basics right there. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, if you see there, uh, it says electrical cable, you see that little red line going from the water onto the land. This photo shows how that happens. They basically drill way down deep under the beach because they don't want that cable in the, in, the, in the surf zone. They go, they drill way down underneath. The cable's about a foot wide. Uh, and then they come up, if you see that little box on the left, it says Upland Cable Vault. That's where they come up on land. Uh, most of the projects I've seen have, have been aiming for a parking lot. And I'll show you a photo of the parking lot on Block Island. So that's what those Upland vaults look like. They're just giant concrete uh, vaults that go underneath the ground. So on the left is them being put in and on the right is after they're put in. So the, the landing spot, uh, there's not much to see. The, uh, the infrastructure is right there under the ground. Uh, and then once the cable's on land, it has to get through to uh, a power station. So this is showing a cable that's going along a road. Not all transmission cables will, will get to go along roads. I think that's, that's probably the best place for them to go, but some will be going uh, you know, anywhere. And then they end up at a power station. So this is, there is some larger infrastructure that needs to be built once the cable gets all the way uh, in inland. And this is a photo of a 1200 megawatt substation, which is pretty big. Most of these projects uh, we're talking about are 400 to 800 megawatts. So that's, that's a big substation, but that gives you a sense of, there is some infrastructure on shore that needs to be built uh, at some point. So why wind power? Uh, you may have noticed, uh, and that's I think what Sarah noticed, that all of a sudden we're talking about offshore wind. Uh, it's really, uh, the conversation has really blown up and a lot of projects have really been proposed just in the last five years. 
um, and that's basically just a reaction to, to climate change. I think we're all familiar with the, the situation we're in with climate change and carbon pollution. And renewable energy, this is probably a little bit more now percentage of our full energy, but it's still a small percentage um, of, of the energy uh, that we're getting is coming from renewables. So if we're gonna stop carbon pollution, we need to go quickly uh, to, to power sources that don't um, make carbon like solar and wind. Um, and basically solar, wind, and natural gas are the cheapest energy right now. They're kind of in a three-way fight. Uh, any, any new project um, is, is a, any new power project is gonna be those three. Uh, nuclear and coal are so expensive. Um, so for electric, electrical generation, it's gonna be either solar, wind, uh, or natural gas and probably a mixture of batteries. Batteries are also becoming much more uh, standard as far as um, keeping our power system running. And it's really the states that are pushing this, this switch to renewable energy. Um, the, the, the feds are jumping in now with the new administration, but it's really been the states leading the way saying, okay, our state's gonna have X percentage of power from renewables by X date. Um, so why offshore? I get asked that question a lot. Why don't we just put them on land? I don't want to. I don't want them in the ocean. Um, personally, I don't want them in the ocean either. Um, but there are some reasons why we're looking uh, in the ocean for offshore wind. One of the big ones is uh, stronger wind speeds. You can see the purples, the blues, the reds. Those are the high wind speeds. If you are from the Midwest, like myself, or or been through there and uh, through the West, you may have seen large turbines out in the plains. A lot of farmers are putting those in um, because there's high wind speeds out there. And you know, if you put a project in a area of low wind speed, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to put a lot more turbines in to make the same amount of power, right? Keep clicking the wrong button, okay. Uh, and then here's where everybody lives. So um, the farther you transmit power, the more expensive it is to, to build a power, you know, power source and uh, depending on the way it's set up, you can lose you can lose power as it's transmitted. So you don't. It's tough to just put all the turbines in the west. You can see out there, um, there's not a lot of big cities uh, because you have to truck the power all the way to the east. So um, at least on the east coast and now the west coast, you're very close to big cities um, and you've got strong wind speeds. Another reason uh, why land can't just be the answer is a lot of people don't want wind power uh, by their house. They don't want turbines by their house. Um, you know, I get it. I, I wouldn't want to be right next to one, that's for sure. But, um, and then some people just can't stand the way they look, so they don't want them anywhere. So it's, it's tough. You, you think about trying to build a turbine somewhere and you're like, well, everything's developed around here. Where is it going to go? Um, so that's another reason to look offshore. <clears throat> another question I get asked is, uh, can't we just do solar? Basically, you know, most people who are looking at climate change are saying we have to do both. We have to do solar and wind uh, and batteries um, because we need them both. And, you know, solar works better uh, during the day, obviously. Wind a lot of times works better in the late afternoon or, or at night. Um, so we need both. Um, and I also just want to give a little perspective on solar, or not perspective, just scale. I, uh, people often say to me, well, we should just put solar on every building, you know, put it on every roof. Uh, and I agree, but uh, I don't think people get the scale uh, of what we would need um, if we just relied on solar. Um, it takes up a bit of space, right? It takes five acres for one megawatt. Um, and I know it's hard to imagine an acre unless you're um, some sort of land person. <laughs> uh, it's about the size of a, of a football field. But um, so for instance, the Kitty Hawk project, which you may have heard of off of, off of North Carolina, which I'll talk about is 800 megawatts. Um, so if you converted that into a solar, onshore solar program, you need, need 4,000 acres. So just, just to give you some scale, I'm, I'm totally pro solar, but it, it, it requires space. Um, here's a project near my parents' house. You can see the tiny cars. This is a five megawatt project. So it's not, not that big of a project. Um, there's a picture of it. You can see the, 
the cute uh what are those called where they make bees they house bees <laughs> in the foreground um, but that's just a photo of a, a five megawatt solar project and that was taking about 25 acres so just to give you some scale on solar because i get that question a lot and one megawatt of power will will supply about 500 homes um, with power Okay, the approval process is long and complicated. Um, you know, these turbines are being proposed in federal waters, which is beyond three miles. So all the federal agencies are involved that you can think of, you know, NOAA, EPA, uh, Corps of Engineers, the Navy, because they're out there, Department of Defense. Um, so all the federal agencies are involved. And then because the power cord, you can see goes on land, goes on shore, then you also need approvals by state and local governments. So pretty much everybody's involved. Uh, so here's kind of the basic, um, and don't get distracted by that cute, um, that cute cartoon. Here's the basic approvals that, that a project needs to go through. The number two, the power purchase agreement, that's not a permit per se, but that's the, that's the financials. That's, that's, usually a state government saying, we will pay you X amount per kilowatt hour for X amount of years. So that's that's a big step. Um, it's basically, a, you know, the contract a wind project needs to get going. Uh, and then Coastal Zone Management Act is a particular approval from each state that they need. And then, like I said, the federal approvals, there's a ton, you can see on the bottom number five, all the other agencies that are involved, but um, number four, BOEM is the lead. So you'll hear BOEM thrown on a lot, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They're leading, leading the, the whole permitting process for the federal government. Um, and they have, you can see A, B, C, D, they have a bunch of steps too. And I'll show you those on the map for the Carolinas. Um, but, oh, and this got a little bit off. I was trying to circle uh, number four, construction and operation plan. That's really your opportunity. There are other opportunities to, to send in comments. We've been doing that for a lot of projects. Um, but number four, the construction operation plan, that's the, the real opportunity for you to hopefully go to a public meeting. It might be a webinar meeting. Um, we'll see. But that's the time to you know, get your voice heard and, and really have the public have their say about these projects. So let's look at the Carolinas. Um, here's the whole East Coast, and you'll notice it stops right <laughs> at North Carolina because that's the furthest south uh, lease. These are all leases, which is kind of, I had that one, two, three, four steps. That's kind of like the second step. So there's about 15 projects proposed off the East Coast. Um, and the only one that's to a le the leasing step is uh, Kitty Hawk, also known as a Van Grid, uh, which owns that lease. And here's another map that's a little bit more to scale of those leases. If you want to go uh, and, and mess around, you can see in the top left corner the Marco Ocean Data Portal. Just Google that. You can get to this map. It's really cool. You can make your own maps. You can add critters. It, it's supposed to stop at Virginia, but it, it, they do go a little bit farther south, and they have, they have all, the wind, um, all the wind leases on there, so you can see those. That's a cool that's a cool free resource that's easy to use. I, I'm not technologically savvy at all, and I can make some cool maps on there. So here's that lease, uh, Kitty Hawk, a van grid, um, about 27 miles offshore, uh, closest, uh, closest spot, spot to shore. And that pink line is where they're talking about putting their transmission cable to shore, landing in Sandbridge. Um, that's a whole different story. We're a little bit concerned with that landing spot. Um, and we're getting the Virginia chapter involved with that, but um, that lease is technically in you know offshore North Carolina. And then way down uh, at the border with South Carolina, there's two wind energy areas. You see uh, it says WEA, wind energy areas. So that's kind of the precursor to a lease. They kind of, the government kind of starts big and then they're like, oh, well, there's fishing here, so we need to cut this out. There's shipping here, we need to cut this out. There's there's whales here, we need to cut this out. So they kind of start big and go down. Um, and so there's wind energy areas are kind of the step before leasing. Uh, it, it sounds like the green one they're not looking at anymore, but they are looking at the blue one, Wilmington East. 
and um, they actually just had uh, an environmental assessment of that project or that, excuse me, that area, and they might start leasing uh, next year in that area. So that's right on the border between the two states. You can see on this map, um, see the green and the blue wind en energy areas. Now you can see those in the top right corner as just blue outlines. Uh, and then the rest of these are call areas. So that's, like I said, they start big and go small. So they start with call areas, then they go to wind energy areas, then they go to leases. Um, but interestingly, these call areas that are off of South Carolina have not gone anywhere since they were pro proposed uh, like almost 10 years ago. So those aren't moving. Uh, I'm not sure why it's probably, it's probably state politics. It's usually, unless the state is like very pro wind, um, things don't seem to move. But I'm not totally sure why those, those haven't moved, um, but they're still in theory uh, offshore South, Carol South Carolina. And then a very strange twist in your area is if you, you all remember during the uh, election last year, uh, the Trump administration just suddenly said, oh, we're not going to do, this is oil, now we're talking about oil and gas leasing. You may have known that there was proposals to, you know, lease for oil and gas drilling all over the East Coast. Florida got out because their governor said he didn't want it. So um, the administration said Florida's out and then everyone said, well, what about us? And so then the Trump administration said, okay, we're not gonna do any leasing in, in Georgia or the Carolinas too. Um, but strangely, they, they said it very broad and didn't just say oil and gas. They said any federal leasing. And so apparently that applies to wind as well. And so that's a 10 year moratorium. It starts July of next year. So it doesn't affect the Kitty Hawk leasing because that's grandfathered in, that's already on the books. Uh, and, and in theory, they could do another leasing. When I, remember I mentioned that Wilmington East, they might do leasing next summer. They would have to do it before July of 2022 because there's this uh, ban on any leasing starting then um, for 10 years. So that is a very strange wrinkle that only applies to your region. Um, and uh, I hope I described it clearly. It's kind of confusing. Okay. So timeline, I mentioned Kitty Hawk, a van grid project up, up near the Virginia border. Um, the NEPA process will be next summer, so there'll be public hearings. So we'll definitely let everyone know about that. And then if it gets approved, it would probably be running by 2025. And then the Wilmington East wind energy area uh, could have leasing next summer before that moratorium starts. Okay, Whew. now we'll get into some impacts. Um, and I think we're at another poll maybe. Okay, we're almost at the poll. So you'll notice it says uh, positive and potential negative impacts. The positive impacts are much more clearly defined. The negative impacts are much more nebulous. So we'll get, we'll get into it. Positive impacts are pretty straightforward. You know, you build X amount of turbines, they make X amount of energy, they make X amount of jobs, they keep X amount of carbon pollution from going into uh, the atmosphere. So the positive impacts are, are pretty straightforward. Um, those, are, those are the easy ones. The negative ones are the, the more nebulous ones. And you've probably heard of some of these. Um, these are the hits, there's, there's some smaller ones, but these are the, the ones people are most um, concerned about. So I'm going to get into each of these, but try to be brief because I mean we could we could spend days here. Poll two, there it is. All right, everybody, wake up. I'm going to try to do another poll. It's going to be very exciting. Poll one, we did that one. Poll two, launch. All right, this one you get to click more than once. So um, if you're concerned about offshore wind or not concerned, or you have one singular concern, go for it. All right, people are pretty generally concerned. I get it. 
All right. There's results. Okay. A couple people not too concerned. Um, whales a big concern. That's 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 a smart concern. And uh, everything else. Uh, fishermen aren't getting any love, but that's okay. They have they have some good representation, so um, we'll take care of them. All right. Stop that. Go back to the. Do, do, do. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, whales was the number one concern from from y'all, and that was a smart concern. Um, we're all familiar, I think, with the right whale, very endangered, and you know, sadly, um, you know, they live near the surface, and they don't seem that smart about getting out of the way of ships. It's not their fault. They weren't uh, evolved. They're involved to to chill on the surface and uh, filter food out of the ocean. So a concern to them is, is extra noise from construction um, and then extra boats being out there um, striking them because that's, that's, how, they're, um, that's how they're dying um, offshore a lot of times it's from big shipping boats uh, hitting them. So that's, that's a big concern because they're very, um, very low numbers. Birds and bats, yes, bats do go offshore. I think less in your area. It's a big thing up here in New York because they cut the corner from uh, Massachusetts down, you know, as they're going south and north, they just cut that whole corner and go over the ocean, which is pretty amazing. Um, but birds, definitely, there's a lot of birds offshore. Um, you know, Europe has had wind for 20 years. There hasn't been uh, like a smoking gun as far as like, you know, this bird species was wiped out. It was the results so far from Europe are, you know, if you look at a turbine field, you'll see some birds are more, more common than they were before they built the turbines. Some are less and some stay the same. So there's, there's kind of some movement there, but that's definitely something we want to see monitored closely uh, and watch for because there are a lot of birds uh, migrating offshore and living offshore. Um, so that's a concern for sure. Um, and this is another scale one. Um, we are concerned about any new deaths of birds, but I do think sometimes people think turbines are the thing wiping out birds, um, and it really is cats <laughs> and climate change. Um, the Audubon Society is 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 pretty um, pretty strongly supportive of offshore wind, which is um, really interesting because they're obviously the biggest bird advocates. But that just gives you a, a sense, you know, we're still. We're still concerned and we want to see mitigation and we want to see monitoring. Um, but if you compare it to like buildings, um, it's crazy. Okay. Poorly planned cable landings. Um, as I mentioned, the power cord needs to come ashore. We actually came out against, there was a proposed landing in Delaware on a, on a um, barrier island and they wanted to build a large piece of infrastructure on that barrier island. It's hard to see from this photo. But um, the chapter in Delaware actually said, hey, um, we're not against the project, but we are against this landing spot. This is a bad landing spot. Um, and they are apparently changing the landing spot. I don't know if it was from us, but we'll take it. Um, we haven't seen the new landing spot yet, so we're not, we're not declaring victory because it might be worse than the, the, this one that they proposed. Um, but, but hopefully it'll be better. Um, EMF, some of you all clicked that on the pole, electromagnetic field, pretty much any power cord, even the little ones in your house, makes a tiny electric field around it, and some animals can detect that, especially like skates, sharks, uh, they look for food in the, in the bottom, in the mud, in the sand, they can detect electromagnetic fields. Um, when they put these cables under the substrate, they go about four to six feet down. And so the concern is that the electromagnetic field, which is very localized, it's, it's basically right there um, at the cable, will uh, you know negatively affect. And there's a cross section of a cable will negatively affect uh, critters. Okay, fishermen access hindered. Um, basically, what fishermen are saying, you know, these these turbines are going to be about a 0.7 to a full nautical mile apart. So they're, they're pretty far apart. Um, but some fishermen are saying, 
you know, if the weather's kind of nasty, I won't be able to operate between the turbines because it won't be safe. And so, um, you know, a lot of them are saying don't build these at all, or they're or they're saying spread them out by like four miles between each one. So there's a there's a big controversy there um, with fishermen. But they're act these these areas won't be closed, uh, and pretty much recreation fishermen in general are very positive because they want to go fish next to these things. Commercial fishermen are the one that are concerned. Coastal views, you probably thought of this one. Um, do you, you know if you like the way that um, turbines look or if you don't like the way turbines look, uh, you will be able to see them in, in, unless they're more than 30 miles offshore, you're gonna see them um, some, some days. A good rule of thumb is kind of 20 miles is 25% of days you'll see them and that's, that's because of weather. Um, you know, in the summer when it's muggy, you know, you can hardly see a few miles offshore, but when in the winter or in the fall when it's dry, you know, you can really see clearly uh, and you, you'll probably see them. This is a mock-up of a, of a huge field. I don't know how many turbines it is, but um, that's a 650 foot turbine at 23 miles. And I think on top of a hill, so this is just a mock-up that, that Bohm made, but that gives you a little sense that would be the clearest day. So that would be one of those 25% days. That's the clearest day. And then here's, here's a taller turbine that's closer. But as you can see, I mean, I can see it on my screen, you can just barely see it, but you might not be able to see it at all. Um, so it really depends on the weather, but that's kind of the size that they would be, you know, little tiny sticks, but you will, you will see them. Most of the projects on the East Coast are about 15 to 20 miles offshore. Like I mentioned, Kitty Hawk is 27, so that one's going to be pretty hard to see. Um, but the, the Wilmington one is 20 miles. Okay, cumulative impacts. Um, you know, we're, there's there's a proposed proposals to build. Uh, you know, I said 16 leases. That's about 2,000 turbines. They keep they keep decreasing the amount of turbines because the turbines keep getting larger. Um, but what is the cumulative impact of putting a bunch of things out in the water that weren't there before. Um, and that's, that's, that's for surf riders, I think the most concerned. Um, I think I have a slide there, I don't. Um, you know, I, I went through all those ne uh, possible negative impacts. The ones we're most concerned about are birds, cumulatively, you know, one project is probably not gonna wipe out some bird, but maybe a bunch of projects would, I don't know. So I think birds, you guys correctly, identified whales as being a concern. Um, and then we're concerned about these, these poorly planned cable landings. So that, I'd say that's kind of our top three where we're most concerned, but we're putting in comments, um, you know, with other groups about all those issues and, and asking for mitigation and monitoring and uh, research. Resources, so if your chapter, um, I've been making some uh, facts for some of these projects. I've, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing it because I feel like no one's reading them. But uh, if your project is getting closer to being a real project, we can make a fact uh, FAQ for you, um, which goes into a lot of detail about a lot of questions about wind, many of which I just went over. Uh, and then we have a, a nice little two pager for tabling. You know, once hopefully tabling starts to be a, be a thing more. <laughs> in the post-COVID world, forever there. Um, this is a nice little two-pager that gives the basics uh, on offshore wind. It's nice to hand to people if they have some just basic questions. So we have that. Uh, and then uh, Sarah and the other Sarah and I can, can send out an email if, if we think that's a good idea with a bunch of, um, of these other resources. You know, other groups have FAQs. There's other websites that have a lot of information. This is Bohm's website. Um, the industry has a website. This is a research website. So there's lots of information. Uh, University of Rhode Island, where the Block Island project is, the only commercial project that's in the water. They're really a leader on wind because they're right there. Um, they have good information. Okay, I think we got it done in 30 minutes. Let's do the last poll and then we'll do questions. Poll number three. Launch. So, kind of seeing what your interest is in this stuff. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, pretty pretty interested. <clears throat> All right, not too surprising. People are pretty interested, and that's that's good to hear. Um, this poll used to be, did you learn a lot? And then I just felt like I was bragging because people were saying they learned a lot. So I took that poll out. Um, okay, so I'll stop sharing. You guys are interested to comment. That's great. We'll definitely let you know when those, uh, when those opportunities to comment are. Stop sharing, yay, okay. And chat, oh no, can you speak up a bit? Was the first comment, did you guys hear me? Oh no. <laughs> Were people able to hear me? I turned my microphone all the way up. And you guys can't. I heard you. Okay. I heard you the whole time. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, will solar technology improve to take up less land? Um, probably. Um, you know, solar is getting better and better, and so you need less and less land. Um, but we just need so much. We need so much renewable power, you know, not only for new power needs, because power needs are still slowly going up, um, but to replace, you know, we got to get off coal and um, natural gas. We got to get off those to, to save ourselves from climate change. So they'll, they'll still need space for solar. Floating offshore wind, yes. Uh, floating offshore wind, there are some commercial projects, but there are, it's a lot less. There's only like two in the whole world where there's like, 50 offshore wind projects that are fixed in the substrate. There's only like two floating ones. So the, the floating technology is a little bit farther behind, um, but that's what they're gonna have to look for on the West Coast if they wanna do any a wind because it's too, it's too deep off the West Coast. It gets deep really quickly. So definitely yes. Um, how will advocates know if a pro's offshore wind project is a bad plan? Um, you know, that's what, Surfrider staff is for. We've been following these projects very closely. Uh, and even better, we're tied into other groups that are, you know, this is this is like my one of my many side gigs as a surfrider staffer. There's other groups like um, NRDC, uh, National Wildlife Federation, who are really leading the way, and they have like five staff that all they do is work on offshore wind. So they're they're we're really relying on them. Um, to, to tell us what, what, is, what is real with, with these projects and, and what is a real impact. Um, but we also wanna make our own call. Uh, like I mentioned that Delaware landing spot, we were the only ones that spoke up about that because we thought that was not a good idea. Um, so basically we're trying to, to keep up with all these projects and um, make sure they're, they're solid. Okay. Um, are there any remediation measures to lessen the impact on birds and marine life? Yeah, and a lot of these, um, uh, like I said, these other groups are really leading the way with, with, you know, they have like experts on whales who are, you know, PhDs in whales. They're asking BOEM to do really specific things like, you know, all ships used in uh, construction can only go 10 miles per hour. Um, if a whale is spotted, you know, operation, construction operation uh, needs to stop because construction is when uh, the really loud, the really loud things are when they're, when they're pounding. They're basically pounding in the turbines like nails into the seafloor. Um, so that's very loud. Um, you know, trying to set up different ways of sensing birds uh, and having people out there observing birds. Um, it's obviously a lot harder than onshore wind where if a bird is killed, you can usually find the bird dead on the ground. So it's a lot harder offshore, but they have, um, you know, ways of looking at, at local um, uh, radar and stuff to see if birds are moving through. So there are definitely remediation me me measures and mitigation measures. And we're asking for a lot of those things. And um, so far getting, getting some of those things, uh, you know, the first real big project is supposed to start construction off of Massachusetts, I think this fall or next spring. So that's kind of, the, that'll be the first large project that's actually gonna start being constructed. Um, and so we're re really gonna look for those, those mitigation measures um, then. Okay, um, I think I'm just gonna unmute 
people if I can figure that out. Or you can put a question in the chat. Let's see here. Or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. That might be the easiest. If you want to, do you see the little raise hand button at the bottom? Ba, 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 ba. No, I don't see it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you unmute yourselves. Oh, okay, you already could do that. Uh, there must be more questions. There's so many questions about when, and don't, don't, if you think it's a out of left field question, don't, there are a lot of things to think about with when. Um, well, so I, yeah. I, ha I have a, um, you know, sort of just something that's just sort of pinging me in my mind is, you know, you didn't necessarily discuss the differences. And I mean, I think it's, for me, it's sort of obvious, but maybe the differences between like the potential negative impacts of offshore wind versus the like very real negative impacts of offshore oil. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of pushback that we get from the communities is like, oh, the whales, which is a very real concern. And like, oh, I don't want to see it, which is also very real. But like the alternative is the continued <laughs> constancy right. and the regularity of the oil spills. And I think that that needs to be sort of brought to the surface. No pun yeah. intended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, good point. And, you know, like I mentioned, basically, uh, I mean, Obama uh, proposed putting oil drilling on the East Coast. Trump basically proposed oil drilling on every coast. Um, and so we're, we're almost literally at a, a, a fork in the road where we can choose more oil and gas leasing offshore, or we can move to wind. Um, and so you're right, there's the impacts not only of climate change, which are very negative for the ocean and all the critters in the ocean, um, but also just operating oil and gas operating. They just they just spill. There's always going to be spills, and everyone's seen um, how bad they can be. Um, you know, and the worst thing with wind is basically they can catch on fire and they burn, and then that's it. Um, which is you know also not cool, but it's a lot better than an oil spill. Uh, which we've all seen and there was just a bunch there was just a bunch of new ones when uh, Ida went through the Gulf it basically happens every time. David asked what percentage of US power needs could wind provide realistically? Good question. Um, I think it's pretty decent. I mean right now we're at like 12% total for renewable. Um, I mean there's a couple big studies showing how we could totally move to solar and wind and batteries, you know, pretty easily with, I mean, not easily, but with technology we have, it's, it's gonna take a big change of, we need to add transmission because you're, you're needing to transmit more electricity, you know, hither and thither. Uh, and you need some batteries to, you know, when the wind doesn't blow, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you need batteries. Um, but, we could really move, you know, start tomorrow and move to all renewables uh, quickly, you know, quickly being like 10 years. Um, it's not that we don't have the technology. So wind could be a big percentage. And I don't know exactly how big it could be, but uh, it could be a big one. Hey, a quick follow up on that. Um, are you aware of any sort of uh, small scale projects? In other words, you know, I, I live on the beach and I always, you know, envision we had a couple small turbines down at the end of the island, you know, enough to power the 500, I guess, what one megawatt power is 500 homes. Yeah. Um, is, is there anything out there like that? Yeah. I mean, the one off of Block Island is pretty small. It's only five turbines and they're only six megawatts each. Um, but that's enough for that's enough for Block Island. And Block Island was excited about it because they were basically on diesel generators which are loud and nasty uh, and expensive. Um, so you can go small, but the problem is it's, it's, it's a, a scale issue where it's, it's almost as expensive to put in, you know, one turbine as it is five turbines um, and the amount of permitting and all that. There's actually a proposal in California to put like three turbines in state waters and, and everyone's like, why, why are we even doing like, why just do three, you know, cause it's, you still have impacts, obviously less because it's smaller, but um, it doesn't lend itself as much to, to small. I think solar is better as a, you know, put solar on your roof and you can power your home, you know, put 
put solar over the parking lot and you could, you know, power a, a Whole Foods or something. Um, and they do have those, I've seen some smaller turbines, um, but it seems like it's, it makes more sense to build large when you're going with wind. Batteries, solar is, this, yeah, batteries, technology, storage is the same for solar or for wind. Uh, it basically just adds uh, flexibility. Um, the onshore transmission grid is so complicated and crazy. I only know a little bit about it, but but basically uh, the transmission operators have a huge region and they're like, they're like mixing and matching. They're like, okay, it's sunny. We have a lot of solar. We can turn down the, uh, you know, the most expensive power right now, which is like coal. Um, okay, there's no sun, there's no wind. Now we need to mix in, um, you know, more natural gas. And then the batteries are uh, a backup. Um, there was recently uh, some brownouts in California and um, people blamed renewable energy immediately, but that wasn't really the issue. Uh, it was a need for a little more batteries and they had some, they actually had some failures of some natural gas um, uh, plants, which was the same in Texas. They all blamed, uh, people blamed wind power in Texas when that storm came through. And it was actually a bunch of natural gas uh, power plants that froze up because they weren't made to be uh, operating in that cold of weather. So um, more and more batteries are becoming part of the mix because we need to be able to hold the power and then disperse it. <clears throat> Based on what you know about um, these processes and how um, you were talking about how they start with sort of a large plot of land and then they slowly turn that large area into like a, a, a wind energy area and then that goes even smaller until they finally define the specific area that they think they're going to put the wind turbines on. Mm -hmm. You know, at least the little bit that I know so far, I mean, for the Wilmington East site that was recently identified, they identified the site and then there was a 30 day window where the public could comment on their thoughts on that particular wind energy area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people, if you're not tuned into this kind of thing, wouldn't even know that there was, that it was proposed or that there was a comment window. So my, my question, I guess, is how much power do you, does you or I have as an individual citizen and or all of us as a, like a, a small collective in the decision-making of whether a, a wind farm or a set of turbines goes in off, off of our, one of our coasts? And or have you seen the power of community activism around that? Play itself out? Yeah, it's that's a good question. It is tricky because it's complicated. There's a many steps. Um, and most people, a lot of people haven't even heard that there's going to be offshore wind, let alone that there's a, a 30 day common period. Um, so it is, I wish it was a better process. I don't know what they could do exactly um, to get people more involved. It's, it's, it's hard, but um, there has been local action it's mostly been opposition <laughs> um like i mentioned that delaware landing spot we'd like to take credit for them saying they're not going to do that anymore but i think it was actually um they had a public meeting and about a thousand people showed up and most of them were against it and so i think that's what made them change their mind um uh, and i mentioned the other environmental groups that we're working with that have a lot more staff that are working on this uh, they are getting some 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 direction and molding this process. I, I believe the Wilmington West wind energy area, I believe that's being scrapped because it's 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 too entangled with right whale migration. And so um, they are listening to some extent to environmental groups and and some of them, um, some of the projects are actually coming into formal agreements directly with, uh, like NRDC to say we'll do X, Y, and Z, um, you know, mitigation as, you know, so you guys don't sue us basically. Um, so it, you're right, it is really hard to get involved. Uh, that's why I was pointing at that, that COP process, the construction operation plan process, because that's when there'll be actual hearings. And if it was normal times, that that's when they would actually have a public meeting that you could go to and say something. Um, 
but it is hard to get involved and some staff staff are trying to keep us in the game i've i've um signed on to a lot of comment letters for just general surf rider not for specific chapters because that it's usually like a two-day turnaround um so we do have skin in the game you know if there ever were lawsuits we could we could point to our record as being on the record asking for this mitigation and that mitigation and monitoring um a good question Right, it's got to be one more out there. <clears throat> All right, well, we can um, we can send out the recording so you can watch this over and over. I'm sure you're dying to. Um, and we can send out some of those uh, resources links too. Uh, I know Sarah Dameron has an email that has all those links on it already, so we could just uh, send it out to folks through the through the chapters. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining. I hope I hope folks learn something about offshore wind. And uh, definitely, if you have any more questions, send me your questions. There's my email in the in the chat. Matt, um, thank you so so much for coming and talking to us tonight. Really yeah. appreciate it. I I traveled I traveled far and wide. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.